character called my protagonist, Gerda, um, sorry, Alison, um, meets an Icelandic woman in Belfast whom she's never met before, but whom someone else she knows knows. But everything about this woman she absorbs and she can't understand why. Good to meet you, she said eventually to the woman. I'll be seeing you later on, I take it, she remarked in a significant way to Niall. I'll be there, on time, he replied, wishing she would vanish. She drove off smartly without waving, and that's the Icelandic woman. At the last moment of their encounter, something about that woman had made Alison's blood run cold. It was as if there was a force field around her, dark and chill. It was only a hint, and for some reason, everything she smelt was bothering her these days. She could hardly enter the supermarket without being repulsed by the smell of biscuits, like a high, sickening wall of goo. And yet hunger gnawed at her constantly. Briefly, she wondered if she was slowly dying, then chided herself for being so neurotic. She was oversensitive, Gideon had said, when they shopped together the day before, and she hurried past the meat counter, nose wrinkled, reacting to things that everybody else took in their stride. Now, this new inexplicable odour had attached itself to her. If she hadn't known better, she would have said it was the sweetly rank whiff of necrosis. But Niall's friend had looked healthy enough, judging by the glow of her skin. Now, as it turns out, Niall's friend does have cancer, and Alison, the speaker here, is pregnant. So there's this kind of collision of set sense absorption, I think, at, at this, this point um, in the novel. So um, that's all really that we're going to read from that. It's just a, it's a demonstration, I suppose, of the negativity. So um, unlocking the senses, as you know yourselves, does not mean necessarily having a rush of positivity and um, exotic or erotic sensuousness. So I won't be going in that direction. Oh. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read um, one from Massacre, two from Massacre of the Birds first. Um, this is my favorite one and I dedicated it to Jean O'Brien who really liked this poem and saw a lot in it at a time when I did it. Hanging house in a canal. Now just watch what a reflection can do. It lay on the other side, the colour of country butter. I longed to enter any way I could, by door, window, chimney, found it locked. But there was a reflection, clear as a mirror in the still waters, the raised brows of dormer bungalows as it hung there, upside down, the poking nose of the porch, the comforting torso of walls. I stripped off, knew immediately what to do, dived, entered that beckoning house, its bubbling whispers and embrace as I burst through its porch reflection. Now, within, I am drowning in secrets, in the company of rats, diving herons, grey roach and crayfish, with my own, as always. So sometimes my senses are, as a writer, are often alert to um, maybe not all the swans and sunsets, that doesn't always do it for me. So I'm partial to both, but you know, when you're writing, you want to write against that. However, this one, this one is called Nocturnal, and it's really just a meditation about being out in my garden in the moonlight one September a few years ago. Excuse me. Nocturnal. In the winter garden at full moon, I watch the fields turn to watered silk a chemise for the ghosts of me. Sense the pace of the journey, steady and slow, across constellations, across my skin. Barefoot, my toes ease out, 
looser to pale fish tails. Nobody sees and I float, released. We are not so alone after all. I can praise the moon which bears the tick of my tired mind, the worn churn of sadness. In this light I can praise a tree, solitary at last. So I stretch myself around the bowl, arms now glittering dorsals, and still nobody sees. I am dropped on a song line to this reef hole. It holds me on secret shelves of light, bushes by day, now filmy cushions that flimmer sea green. Moon and trees lit to new shapes, the lobe of my darker self swimming free. I am all tail and fin, scales bulged with the weight of words, my fugitive grace. There is nothing but this rhythm, rocking, rocking. And um, I'll just um, try a new one or two. <laughs> this, uh, the next, I, I do have a lot of water imagery in my work, there's no doubt about it. I'm very fond of, just drawn to rivers, lakes, sea. And I call this one the flaggy shore and it's in memory of Seamus Heaney uh, because we stopped off there recently on our way back from County Clare and having read his poem, um, it's not called the flaggy show. The post script. The post script, thank you. Uh, so it, it sort of references that. You pull in on a September morning, making time to ease the journey east. Watch three women in the white ringed shallows. Their plangent murmurs rise across a bay where light and water drift to the horizon, uncontested by wind. Sandpipers mewling moss, knotted rack, the ochre sandals cliffs. At first, your mind still tilts at memory of an evening things came loose, a dire subaqueous rubble. But now you find your shoreline, untroubled, wild, and in between. Softly, this place captures tight and clean. You wade into the slate and white, in no time, striking off and out to cross the bay. The next one is called im, after the Irish word for butter, right? And uh, I was the daughter of a creamery manager, and who, when I was a child, used to bring me into the, the dairy in various parts of the creamery. And as a young child, this was a marvel to me. But my father was from Munster and he pronounced the word differently. However, Im. You follow through thick doors to the dairy, that white domain where the butter maker reigns, her cloth wrapped head nodding to dad as he shows you the new stainless steel artery where butter, Im in his Munster Irish, slowly pours down into brown boxes. In school, you're learning M, the Ulster way. The odour fresh, sweet, no word in Irish or English to speak against butter, how it enfolds the heart, that the dava inna turns crushed potato to a noble shining melt, that brown bread lightens to a mealy crumble with mal inna. You learn too that insincerity on the tongue amounts to buttering you up. But in the dairy, the python thick stream, its alchemic parsing, parsing soothes. M, sheath on chilled innards, cob yellow as it fattens the soul long after it leaves the feed fields, the creamery, your childhood, where you learn that nourishment is yellow, that it is also butter, noun, from the Greek buteron, or cow cheese. And in my final poem, because I don't want to um, hog, hog space. Um, um, sorry. Um, 
my final poem is, uh, it was inspired by a visit in Galicia in northern Spain to uh, the ethnographic museum there in Santiago de Compostela, where there are all these wax and body parts on display. So you could have, for example, a breast or a penis or a leg or anything that has been subject to illness or ailment. And, uh, you know, these are talismanic objects that people used to have. And the, the poem is about, it's sort of about loss of faith whilst keeping faith. I, I have a religious dimension, I'd say, to my work, probably, or if that's the right word. The parts. Let us collect a waxen body part from the corner shop just after dawn, dawn before the newspapers are delivered. An arm for you, a hip for me, a heart for him, phallus, breast or tongue. Even if we no longer believe in a god and no one in their right mind believes there is a celestial form which our ailments will fit for the cure of mystery bodies, let us take the waxen parts of the old aunt's failing limbs, the claw of her paralysed arm, her frozen right leg, trembling bottom lip, a tongue which forgets to close off saliva. Take her wheelchair also. It has absorbed the illness, needs molecular healing. Take a daughter's S-shaped spine, the scar tissue on her left lung. Let us bear the knots of the fishmonger's arthritis, his pinched feet, and short hot tendons, lay them in wax on an operating table where belief in a god is not required. Take our hearts in wax, lay them as a sign that multitudinous fragments, hanging hearts and phalluses, used up wounds, legs, arms and spines, may despite all rise as one to be read and marveled at even before the newspapers are delivered. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much for your It's always great to hear you read, I think. Uh, and you certainly gave us a play with the sets. It's way beyond the sun sets and swans. And, uh, <laughs> although we might revisit some Nothing sets and swans later <laughs> on in our chat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our next reader will be uh, Mark Manning. And Mark is a poet and photographer. His photographs have been exhibited in the RHA and the DLR Lexicon uh, Municipal Gallery. His first solo show, Ghost Fight, was held in the DLR Lexicon in 2019. His fifth collection of poetry, Ghost Fight, New and Selected Poems, was published by Sam Poetry in 2017. And lives a brave as well for some two dogs. <laughs> Thanks, and uh, thanks Tanya as well, um, and it's lovely to read in this um, local festival, since I live just literally around the corner now, since I've, I and nearly everybody I know has moved to Bray. Um, so it's, uh, it's a lovely opportunity, and it's, uh, it's only a pity that it's the last one, but I completely understand how uh, Tanya is far too busy to keep running this. I couldn't do it myself, so. Anyway, uh, I'll begin at the end with a poem called The End. The End, etc. The world ended on October 22, 1844, as William Miller's disciple had predicted it would. We are living in its aftermath, along with all the other Millerites who suffered through what became known as the Great Disappointment, to regroup later as the Adventists and then the Seventh-day Adventists, who now have worldwide membership of 20 million souls. The human mind is a step on ant that miraculously unsquishes itself to invent braille, write a brief history of time, or develop a new material, something that will prove impervious to the slightest trickle of doubt or the weight of the toddler's sandal, which is the weight of the world insufferably carrying on. 
uh, one of my cousins here, Pat. Um, this is a poem addressed to him because it's something he went through uh, when he was just a teenager studying for the Legion. Um, and some may be familiar with my here today and know what I'm talking about. So it's for Patrick, and it's called Dublin, 5.32 p.m., May 17, 1974. You're crossing from Mount Street to Merriam Square when the third one goes off near Green's bookshop. Does the wind of it touch you? Blitzed glass from windows that had reflected an overcast Friday evening sky crunch underfoot. As you find yourself among the dazed and cut spilling from shops and offices and the bodies, you don't stop for a closer look, but keep on steadily walking as if guided through what the evening had been displaced to by those who made such things their business. Still clear in your distracted head after 50 years, I said, imagine if you had got there a moment earlier and you, believe it or not, it had never, I had never thought of that. A coordinate on the unsmooth breathing map, you cross the city, climbing the creaky stairs to your biology grind in a room down by the quays where you try to concentrate while sirens swarm around you, the country of the living, still so wide its borders hold you easily mid-stride. Um, I've been writing, I've been discovering all the fantastic walks in Ray, and I've been I've surprised in way how many poems I've actually written that are now set in Ray. Um, this is one that I just wrote the other week. Um, I was bitten by something really painful, <laughs> and uh, I reckon it was horsefly, I'm not sure. So this is just called horsefly. And of course, it addresses that uh, one of the senses, certainly the sense of touch or pain. Horsefly, or was it? Something, in any case, that pricked precisely as a needle intubated my inner arm. Something tiny and fierce, with a will focused on blood, flew or fell into my open fleece as we walked narrow, autumnal, fawn roads. Something that made its mark, a definitive red dot that still itches over a week later. Something the color of a dead leaf's underside, detached from cattle shift, luminous straws strewn across the dark path like a newly thrown Ejen. Piled clouds, hedgerows, the stubble's muddy gold, September at loose, breezy and wild, as a horse stamping and switching its tail. Um, again, this is another poem set in Bray, quite a different poem. This is uh, essentially a prose poem. Um, <coughs> it was um, Thangel Armitage, who had written a whole bloody book of prose poems, who then turned around and said they were a sick joke. Um, but, in fact, prose poems exist, and they're a viable form. Baudelaire wrote them, um, of course, Francis Ponge uh, popularized them down at the, back at the beginning of the 20th century. But um, the reason this is a prose poem, really, is because it is so prose what I'm talking about is so prosaic. Uh, so I think it kind of fits the form, or lack of form. Anyway, it's called The Usual, uh, Bray, January 2022. Cool evening, walking the dogs on a circular route that takes us steeply uphill through the quieter suburbs. Streetlights begin to jitter on from rose to iodine as the evening darkens gradually around us. When we reach the top of the hill, I stop for a moment to look over the roofs at the deepening blues of sky and horizon, the almost stationary lights of ferries or container ships out there. They seem close, as in a Bruegel seasonal painting or his landscape with the fall of Icarus. Then downhill, submerged again among busier streets, people climbing out of cars, carrying their shopping into houses, pushing a buggy, stopping to talk, or trailing a long phone conversation, a few wearing masks, most not. The whole thing happening in now time, an ongoing untheatrical theater, pedestrian, quotidian, unmemorable, nothing to see but this transparency in which the evening goes on unfolding, solid, fragile, and beautiful as anything on the brink. Um, one more poem, I think, about walks and Bray. This is called Grass, and again, it's um, 
subtitle, Bray Head 2020. So this was in the midst of what we all went through. Grass. I don't think I've ever seen grass this luxuriant, a seedy, waist-high crop, cresting over, deepening the thin, trodden paths. Two children, bright as crayons, walking a dog through the frothy, sibilant sea. Rampant, wild grass with a light breeze searching for a parting that keeps the whole slope weaving and unweaving. Bend closer and each shivering tip rises, tapestry bright, distinct as a headdress or a working quill, as if the field were breathlessly inscribing its own epic. What are you? Tufted hair, canary, lime, meadow fescue, crested dog's tail, common bed, meadow's cat's tail. I must now add to my ignorance of bird calls this illegible grass flattened here and there with forms where families had picnicked, where lovers rolled. Bespoke grass, tailor-made for a doze, grass to lose a million needles in or find them, grass working in shuttle loom, grass to make wishes on, grass with no design other than to be grass, feathering its own nest, grass like us. Um, so my thing about, I suppose, unlocking the senses is that we're, we're completely it, it is our universe, the senses. And there's a quote from Nabokov, a wonderful book that he wrote called um, Speak Memory. Uh, and it begins with, um, if I can remember it correctly, um, we are the cradle rocks above an abyss and we are born between, uh, uh, between two eternities. No, I can't get it wrong now. Cradle rocks above an abyss and we are born in a crack of light between two eternities of darkness. I think that's roughly it. Anyway, so we're in this crack of light, and the crack of light, the way we, we exist in the crack of light is through the senses. So I'm fascinated by the senses, and the first poem that made a big impression on me was D. H. Lawrence's Snake, you know, where a snake comes to his water trough. It was in the school anthology. Um, a snake comes to his water trough in, in uh, July, uh, in Sicilian, Sicilian July, with Etna smoking. And the, there was a beautiful sensuality in that poem, and it kind of stayed with me. I think that, you know, we pick up other traces as we write. And, um, I know I'm influenced by lots of other people, Derek Nahan, for instance, maybe Alice, Alice Oswald nowadays, um, Heaney, obviously, you know, it all goes in there. But I think I can trace it all back partly to that poem by D.H. Lawrence uh, and the, the imagery and the sensuality. Anyway, um, even when I think of, you know, um, things that are not sensual, in fact, the opposite of sensual, uh, the afterlife or, um, you know, uh, the idea of heaven, uh, it comes back to me, for, uh, for me it comes back to the senses. And this poem perhaps um, explains that to some extent, or tries to encapsulate it. It's called Heavens. Simone Weil thought humans don't have the power travel in a vertical direction, but should keep one eye on heaven and wait for God to pick us up, like a parent on a school run. Auden designed his paradise meticulously, down to landscape, means of transport, interior decor, and statues, only famous, defunct chefs. According to the Catechism, a state of supreme and definitive happiness, the goal of the deepest longings of humanity, migration to the great pleasure center, warm heart of the hive, fanned by wings. Do you want to be happy forever and ever? Bliss without end. Amen. Talking heads might be nearer the mark, a place where nothing ever happens, but at least there's a party. Our deepest longings, swarming us into burning walled cities, 4 a.m. bars, any place to muffle that scratchy little voice, unbearable as tinnitus, who or what kind of contraption am I? And why do I want what I really, really want? Maybe it's where good jokes go after they die. The Tommy Cooper kind, a few simple props, the timing perfectly imperfect, right to the last. Everything is prepared. There is no excuse. I come with my big, dumb suitcase, bulging, haphazardly packed, and would like to go somewhere Take the Senate route, the Blue Highway, from here 
to appear. How long have I lived? I have no watch. I can be in Okay, and uh, so one more. Um, okay, so. Um, I'm reading really one from my ghost like book. Um, ghost light. Say so not ghost like. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's an interesting skill. Um, okay. I read one called Gripstick, which is about um I don't know, it comes out of the books, but already. I don't know if people know what a gripstick is. Um, if you've suffered uh, from having problems reaching for things, uh, grip stick is, is quite handy, especially if you're serious arthritis or anything like that. Anyway, grip stick. The man emptying bins on the prom might be my age, though healthier looking, tanned, bare-armed, in a high-vis jacket and black ski cap. He plucks at stray bits of litter with that familiar metal rod with its Dalek pincer, the same as the one I bought for my mother in Fanon's some years before she died. A gadget so starkly ingenious, surely it's a branch of a family tree of similar inventions of Bakelite, whalebone, leather, wood, going back, back to that afternoon in her nursing home, a year and a half ago, when I hold her hand and feel it loosen, then go slack, and call the nurse who says quietly, Yes, she's going. And I look out the window to see the usual glorious rubbish, clouds not stopping their tumble over Kalini Hills, huddle of slates and satellite dishes, while I am abruptly in a different country, the landscape of her open palm, tiny in the grip of what gave way. Thank you. Much more. And I always think about this and those, especially the grey ones. Mm -hmm. They're all dated, I like the way they're, they're grounded in time, mm -hmm. which made me think about maybe the way time affects the senses as well, and how we experience the world changes over time as well. We'll get back to that. So, mm -hmm. uh, our next reader uh, is Kieran New York, and uh, Kieran lives in Galway. His first collection, The Great Bread, was highly commended. By the Forward Foundation, the Poetry of 2019. The second collection, Phantom Gang, is published, I believe now, by the Irish Pages Press, and his extended essay, American Epic on Past, is available as a pamphlet from the Barrier Press. So, thank you. Thanks, million folks. It's really great to be part of this, uh, this reading panel. I've enjoyed it so far. <laughs> uh, uh, I thought I'd read a few poems from the, the new collection, which um, was supposed to be published uh, over the summer, but there were a few delays. Uh, but anyway, I'm told that it's, it's very close to arriving in the world, so hopefully. Um, the first poem is called Bailages, which is just the Irish word for folklore. Um, and I wrote it after going to a gig that uh, my friend Owen Canavon was performing in. I'm not sure if there are any trad or Shandos fans here today, but anyway, so, uh, it's his life and soul, I think, Irish music, and his first solo album actually is on the way, so that's my somewhat biased recommendation <laughs> if anyone's interested. Um, anyway, Owen and his singing were the uh, inspiration for this poem. Bellages. The Shandos songman hooks a thumb in each belt strap and leans his hip to the wall to wait like a ship in shallow sands. So whatever waver, tilt, or rooting down the brick-lined room allows is his, or comes to rest within as the crowded air rebuilds to hush, and soon the song descends, oh, with a voice as dark as the river mouth, as subtle as wings are deep, as bitter as hail on a bed of stones, as fogged and low with grief. Like the girl who buried her shadow, or the woman who flew in her sleep, or the man who's less than a whisper now, who once regaled the seas, whose lover was sent to another.
at the price of a penful of sheep. Um, after my grandparents died, I found myself missing them, of course, uh, but also I felt a real sense of severance from the area of North Leitrim, where they were from, uh, and where we always used to visit them. So I wrote this very short poem uh, and a couple of others afterwards uh, about that place and about that sensation. So it's just called Rosinburn. Let the sky thin seasons stake their claim in the ditch of my eyes, in the flood of my bones, in the torn out root of my mouth. I'll move like light in the dirt or a lifting lark, like rain at the edge of your meadowed mind. Um, the American poet William Carlos Williams, uh, he once said that it is difficult to get the news from poems. Uh, and then he went on to contradict that uh, almost immediately <laughs> and complicate it in interesting ways. But I still thought the original idea was a compelling one, uh, that it's difficult to get the news from poems. And I interpreted it very literalistically and uh, began writing poems that tried to stitch together different news stories uh, published on the same day and in the same paper uh, with, a, you know, with a view to getting a kind of clearer uh, perspective on this strange world we're living in. And so I'm afraid this has a somewhat unpromising title. It's called Black Hole. Um, I'm not sure if people remember this, but there was a report anyway in the Guardian newspaper about the first ever image, uh, photographic image of Black Hole, maybe two or three years ago now at this point. Um, which anyway, this was thought to be a kind of scientific breakthrough uh, up until very recently. You know, that was a kind of you know, impossible feat. Uh, and so that was one news story. And then the second one was about a very inspiring press release from Mark Zuckerberg uh, and uh, social media company Facebook, which is now Meta, but at the time it was Facebook. So uh, it's a very thrilling poem, I promise. <laughs> uh, uh, black hole. A void packed in with falling light so thick the scaffolding collapses. No chink of dust or flume survives. The cosmic tenebrum sinks down from black to outer black forever. Today, 200 scientists breathed out as one a folding ripple breath of joy as the first and only images came clear of this all-devouring heart of shadow shape, a monster larger than our solar space roaring blankly in the dark. Its universal upset visioned now and funnel fed to all the earth, where Facebook yesterday decreed a lasting tweak or two to how the dead are housed online. From here on in, a sifting string of digit code will pluck their future birthdays from the flow. The hidden data mine grows still, so remaining users' pain is stayed, and the tight knit sight itself remain a place of love where life lives on. That's my best uh, Mark Zuckerberg impersonation. <laughs> That's very good. A couple of years ago, uh, a friend of mine gave me a uh, book of translations from the poetry of Bertolt Brecht, a German playwright and poet, who was famously or notoriously, depending on your point of view, uh, quite a politically engaged uh, character. But uh, anyway, this was uh, a gift in more sense, in more ways than one, because uh, I don't actually speak any German, and this is stopping from trying my own versions of uh, the same poems, uh, which I don't mind actually, because I think most readers reinvent the poems they read in their own image. You know, it's one of the exhilarations of poetry when you discover echoes and reflections from your own experience in the words of a stranger. <laughs> so anyway, this sequence of poems. Uh, it's just a record of my own response to these translations of bread as I was reading them. Uh, and I, I won't go through the whole sequence, but I'll, I'll just take a few extracts from it. As, here's the first one. The people I love are, are bright and harsh. Their fingers stitch the velvet coats. Their bodies lift the singing rose. They shape the wheat. They shape the loaf. They carve the skyline named in stone for the emperor and the boss, and they always bite the famine dirt when their ledgers lodge a loss. 
but they know far more than this, oh yes, as the wave ungulfs the ocean and the slave commands the dawn, my people's hands have threshed the wind, their faces priest the sun. Two. What today you call a river, to me was second nature, gifted, like the grey boughs donning winds weather in a rush above me years before, or the pounding clouds that clutched the forest doors for days till birds emerged to shake the clearing after, and the rains she kissed me under disappeared forever. The touched earth, evolving lovely down my body, this the haunted mist I breathed involuntarily, woe to year by year. Three. What is food for? To close a hungry dream with heat. What do dreams become? A star, a stone, a fist, a mob, to make the richest citizens tremble in their beds. What are poems for? To fortify the body, to weaponize the mind. What should we remember? Amid the chronicle of cruelties, my yearning to be kind. Who is this? Wrecked, so mean, so dry, so stricken, so strong, I could sleep or march to spring. Uh, and finally then, I thought I'd just go back to North Leitrim, because I'm still very fond of the place. And um, this is on Follow Clearer, and it just gathers together a few memories I have of walking, I suppose, in the landscape and hills around Ross um, And I should say, this isn't essential to the meaning of the poem or anything, but my granddad, when he was alive, he used to admire and was always quoting uh, Ode to a Skylark by Percy Shelley, a romantic poet. Uh, so that poem begins, uh, Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert, that from heaven or near it pours thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. It goes on like that. It's, it's kind of a tongue twister, <laughs> among other things. Uh, but I thought anyway that I would try to echo um, that poem uh, in, in a couple of moments as, as my own unfolded, uh, rather than stating directly, I remember my granddad reciting it. I thought it might be just a kind of quieter way of paying tribute to, uh, to that original poem. Anyway, this is the clearing. Thanks again for, for having me along. No photograph collates the deep climb up those muck blue lines of bog trap, slowed to set the winds awry and bend the cloud light backwards into rain, or the clambering finish after our bustle and whoop and swift declension as knees brace down for the peaty gaps and voices swing for home below, where all the afternoon he's moved about mowing the rushes to a shaken green, honing nature's art of unpremeditation with a cleanly disposition, even as a blade. Memory alone retains what need has told us life was like, a shimmer implicated in the faded picture falling now through the gripping fingers of this poem, which says in doubtful, delving faith of time, that somewhere still we're paused perpetually on a hilltop flecked cotton white and swayed to motion round us as we rest, our faces fixed for lark wings on the rise to the high lit spaces, to the billowing sun, our sky filled breathing, holding fast. Kind of beauty. I suppose when we think about uh, the, the central world, I, I think about the romantic poets uh, straight away, and we all do to an extent, but there's much more in the world we've heard today, I think. Uh, Mary, maybe you might just talk a little bit about 
the, the example of prose you gave, I thought was really good because you gave a sense of how the senses can be used to deliver a kind of a, if you like, what you were calling a negative message almost. But, uh, but in your poetry, I think uh, you were able to show a much more positive message of the senses being used in the poems you read. So maybe, but do you find it's different writing in prose, or writing a conversation story, and how you, how you approach it from a sensory point? Probably, you know, there's a lot more, basically there's a lot more space of time yeah. to just do everything, to experiment a bit. But, um, well, let's see. No, yeah, that, that small, short piece of prose, it, it was really just to illustrate how in all kinds of situations we are like a little strip. You know, our, our entire being is like a little strip being dipped into what's happening, into the momentary and absorbing stuff subliminally anyway that maybe when you think back later on, you realise something actually took root or something registered. Uh, I, mean, I would say that um, my attitude to the idea of, you know, I don't, of, let's say beauty in poetry, was kind of, for me, it was radicalised when I read the Polish poets of the post-war period, like, Tadeusz Roosevelt and people like that, who just questioned the whole idea of what poetry should be about, and um, you know how do we approach the idea of beauty? You know, isn't it time to walk away from admiring, you know, white swans? Now, no apologies to W. B. Yeats, but um, that's an exception. <laughs> but um, you know, I suppose the cliche-written element of um, poetry that's hovering without ever becoming more, maybe more politically engaged, perhaps. Yeah. Yes. I mean, your poetry is politically engaged as well, as much as anybody's really. I think when I think about the I didn't read much of that today, you know. Yeah, I know, yeah. but, it, but it can be. For those who know your work, it, it is very politically engaged. And Mark, like you mentioned all of these, whether you were reading one of your poems, in one of your poems, and the other one I would see is one of those English poets who probably uh, it was more interested in the urban landscape rather than the, the natural world yeah. and the natural beauty. So, sure. And I, I kind of look at your work as a photographer along that line as well. I did with mm -hmm. that you're kind of engaged with the urban more so than the rural element. Although maybe now that you're in brain, as you can see, <laughs> yeah. it's, your, your rural element is, is emerging. Yeah, well, brain, of course, is urban as well. It is. Um, but uh, you, I, I mean, yesterday I was on board and Dave, and we both found ourselves photographing clouds, <laughs> as usual. Uh, and clouds are wonderful, I love clouds, but um, you know, you can just, uh, they're, they're always there, and they're always worth photographing in a way, but and the other, you know, it, it kind of becomes a visual cliche then, because, you know, everybody nowadays is a photographer, everybody has a phone, um, and I'm sure a lot of other people photograph clouds. Uh, when I started, taking photographs in the 70s. Nobody had um, a decent camera. I mean, it was unusual to find somebody with an SLR. Uh, but now everybody does, and that shifts things a little bit in interesting ways, um, I think, you know? Um, I, I take too many photographs. I have over 10,000, God knows, maybe it's 20,000 now on the iPhone, you know? And it, you, you find yourself taking, kind of falling into this sort of rhythm, I suppose of photographing the same things. And occasionally then you you know, you get something interesting, certainly in, in the woods that I walk through, you know, you sometimes get a sense of presence maybe, and just the way a certain dark tree stands out in a sort of a tunnel of trees. Um, you know, the same with tree roots maybe, or you know, there are ways of doing this sometimes very hard to find an angle though. And it's the same with poetry. Yeah, you know it's, it's a, you're looking for another perspective, I suppose, at yeah. times. You're and talking, you, sorry. Yeah, no, in, in terms of, I was thinking in terms of your writing, say, mm -hmm. and is that kind of sameness, maybe, of, of the world being produced generally? Does that provoke you to go look into something different or find to do things in a different way? Yeah, um, I think it's hard sometimes to find. I mean, I, you know, I'm not sure I even know what propels me. Uh, as, a, as a writer, as a poet, uh, you know, you, you find yourself, I think, well, somebody said, I can't remember who it was, that, you know, essentially we're writing the same poem over and over and over again. 
Maybe it's the same to some extent with photography, though probably not. Um, photography is quite different. Photography and poetry uh, are almost diametrically opposed in certain ways, and yet there are those, you know, there's contrast in both, there's imagery in both. Um, but I, you mentioned swans and um, what was the other thing? Sunsets. 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 Yeah, what, I, what struck me about this, and I, I'm totally with you in terms of, you know, you know, it's the, the kind of romantic cliche, but does anybody really write about spots and sunsets anymore? I mean, if you read contemporary poetry, there's very little. Mary, what do you think? Or, yeah, Kira, yes, or you know, I, I don't know if anybody. Yeah, and there, there is a different kind of cliche now, and there are different, or I should say plural, there are different kinds of cliches. I mean, there is the kind of the poem that is is out to shock, you know, but but that's kind of lost its oomph nowadays, you know. Um, we're in a peculiar space, I think. You know, back when Orwell was writing, he was a modernist as the early 20th century, and yeah, he wrote about yeah, Orwell loved writing about abandoned trains, you know, that kind of. He loved trains, you know, and of course he wrote, you know, the, the one about the the, the non train crossing the border and all that. Um, but Yes, yeah, sorry, go on. Please do. With yeah. the photography thing and what you were saying, how everyone can, everyone's a photographer mm -hmm. nowadays or whatever. Uh, uh, but I, I remember that the first time that I saw something properly magnified was um, using a microscope at school, and I saw an onion skin under a microscope yeah. when I was about 17. And you know what that stuff was then. And I just thought this was simply amazing to see the hitherto invisible. Yeah. You know, and um, and I did it with telescope as well when mm. I was uh, when I was a teenager. So that was the other thing. But these the phones that we have now give everybody a chance to experience every little Which is thing on a yeah. pebble if that's what your bag is, yeah. so the pores on skin. Yeah. I mean, you can do the most amazing things. You can. And how do we? You know, is that happening in poetry? I don't know. I mean, I just don't. Know. And, and it's in a sense that some poets, it's not there anyway. It might be. So, no, that's that's that. There is probably an element yeah. of that, at least, well, yeah. it's it, always it's inclined to feel guilty. Yeah. It's a more democratic yeah. way of seeing it, you know, yeah. and it's, again, it's still up to individual interpretation. Yeah. It is democratic, yeah. it does. Here, I'll just, uh, yeah. but just to go back to, to your reading there as well, like, uh, talking about the democratic and, and all of it. I know you were politically engaged with that, but there seems to be, uh, like, you, you write a lot about the natural world. Well, and you, you have done from, I remember reading your song bombs from the Vermont oh, yeah. edition, back back yeah, that's years ago now, and, uh, and they were really good bombs, I thought, at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems to me that like, all of us, and you particularly, see how you sort of developed your own sensibility about how you wrote. And so when you write about nature, it's not just like someone describing nature. It's in the context of a lot of other things that you write about as well, and one of them being political engagement, you know, and figures of history and things like that. Sure, yeah. Uh, well, thanks for that very insightful interpretation, obviously. <laughs> and I think maybe in the age of climate change and global crisis, crises, um, I, I think most of us do feel an urge to appreciate what we think of as beautiful or what we find valuable in the world, but to combine that at the same time with, I, th I think we want a kind of critical understanding of what's happened or you know, where we're heading, right? So those, they seem to be kind of, uh, you know, two instincts that are pointing in opposite directions, but I think they're actually tied together, and maybe that might account for yeah. some of those conflicts. It's, it's what Mark is saying, you know, it's, the Mark and I said that, you know, you know, you can only, you can't, really, you can't write, you know, particular kinds of poetry, you can only write the kind of poetry that you know, write. You know, that you can't kind of force yourself. Yeah, but you just sort of think. Yeah. So, I mean, it's the lived experience, I suppose, that we all have. But, but on top of that, with, with you guys, is, there is a real intellectual engagement as well going on, as well as the mm -hmm. sensual engagement as well. So, like reading your poems, say, not particularly poems read now, but there's a lot of ekphrastic poems. There's poems yeah. about photographs, poems about photographs, mm -hmm. yours, and poems about photographs and yours. Here on as well, and maybe you can get started in the France yeah. poems as well. So that's that to my mind is really it's kind of like a marrying of the sensual and the intellectual. 
But that, that's obviously a big part of what people are doing. Yeah, it's, it, it's, I, I wonder sometimes if it's, it, it's a kind of Irish obsession because you have Derek Manns uh, who has written, you know, and he had a collection, two collections actually titled after paintings, Courtyards of Delft and Dawn by Night, Michelle's painting. Um, and you know, he's fascinated by it. And the scream, of course, Munch's painting. You know, and he's fascinated by that. And so am I. I mean, you know, I find it, uh, it's the, yeah, it's sometimes when I take a photograph, uh, I, end, I end up writing about it. It doesn't often happen, but it sometimes does. So they do inform uh, each other, those two particular ways of looking. Um, but I do think it's sometimes, is it an Irish thing that we're, we we tend to be obsessed by writing about paintings or more images? No, I don't think so. No, I don't think it is, but it's not just. Oh! I'm quite a quiet and a lot critical and a lot less, and I've got that classic fan from. Yeah, Sue, I know, I know, I know, I don't mean it's only an Irish thing, but I'm. It's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not an Irish thing. I mean, I don't mean it's only an Irish thing, but I'm. It's. No, I think there are lots of. Ah, well, I know. It's just, maybe it's just from. Um, the, the interesting thing about that, that I remember covering on Derek Bannon's The Hunt by Night is um, mm. something about the vanishing point in that painting, isn't there? The, you know, the vanishing point. Do you remember mm. that? that there's a, and it's, mm -hmm. it's really well, a fascinating image. It, in a way, there almost is no vanishing point because the whole thing is for that overlapping rather than. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's also the picking up of texts where yeah. Yeah, it's not just. Like we mentioned the legendary heroes, mm -hmm. and the epigraph to that is oh, yes. that extract from the local from the folklore, uh, folklore, folklore uh, uh, and, and, yeah. and, and you can then go into the poem itself, which is responding to the epigraph. So, and there's we get a lot of that too. I mean, your work where you relate to you know, the start of figure, and you know, that's the context that was a poem was born then, also. So, we're you're referencing. Back to art in one way or another, whether it be painting or whether it be text. Sure, I think sometimes whether you're reading or writing poetry, uh, the experience of that for me is just a kind of heightened attentiveness, right? And so once you, if you can kind of hold on to that mode, then it becomes a kind of politically, or there's a kind of political potential in that, right? Or it kind of automatically leads to other items, whether it's to, to art or nature or in politics, or sometimes all of them. But I think attentiveness is. The state of that so it's, it's kind of like the idea has become the charge you know, rather than say like the natural world set for instance was maybe in romantic times but like the idea or the, the artwork or ideal maybe well it was the charge but it's one of them yeah, yeah. yeah. what do you say there it is i think you're, everything in art has to do with paying attention yeah. no matter it is paying attention to something very you know yeah and, and, it's a way of being human as well, I think, you know, kind of increase our yeah. connection to one another and to the world we're in. <laughs> and you mentioned up in your reading uh, the connections that you find in other people's work and how surprised you always feel when you find something that really, you know, hits home to you in somebody else's work. Oh yeah, it's, it's an addictive yeah, it experience in, in poetry, I think. I might just open it up to the floor there and see it. So I was just going to ask, you said something that Lark had said, and I was very interested, I'm a painter, but I was just very interested in, 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 in you know, just uh, something along the lines of, that, that's a terrible paraphrase, that's why I'm asking. My uh, no, not a terrible paraphrase on my part, but just, just to, uh, people don't pursue categories of kinds of expression, but they need to look back on what they need to express themselves, was that something? I, I, I didn't have the quote quite right, but I think what he was driving about uh, was that you can't be, say, as an artist, you can't just copy. I can't say, I'm going to write like Mark Brown here. Mm. I have to, all I can do is write you know, like Brown you know. Uh, and, and that's a really all that Clark, and I think the same, is that he couldn't, I think it was D.H. Lawrence, he wanted to be like, when he was younger. Yeah, well, he more Yeats, Yates, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Was it, yeah. He described his early work as Yates and Water. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that's what he was driving at, that you can really only be yourself. Yeah. Oh, right. And yourself is, as we kind of mm. been driving towards that, it's the accumulation of all those things in your life, the experiences mm. and the sensations that you have. I love the thing that you said about paying attention. 
putting this cloak and covering in front of my the previous one, because I'm kind of flying out a lot of this one. But um, I wrote a lot of poems that um, from really. And one of the things that I got so fed up with all these artists sitting there, just sitting there and drawing. You know, and I thought, well, why can't I do that as a poet in the same way? I'm trying to write a series of poems as if I was doing drawing. And um, I think that drawing and poetry have a, a really common sort of basis because, I mean, I don't to be an artist at all, but something, if you've ever done live drawing class, I'm trying to draw a still line from the negative space between. There's something about that in poem, so I feel the silence between the lines, which is really like that process of looking and drawing. So I, I really like it. Oh, thanks, yeah. Actually, what you said there reminds me of uh, uh, the art critic John Berger. Uh, mm -hmm. I think one of the last books he published before he died was called Confabulations, but it's, um, it's, it's a short enough book, but it's, it's punctuated by his own sketches throughout, and I think he actually he makes a similar point about poetry and drawing oh, in that, but uh, yeah, it's interesting. He was, I haven't read that book by the Berger, it's one from his yeah. sketches. What was that quote, pardon me, that Berger said in the difference between? Oh yeah, photography, I played it. The difference between photography and painting, he said that uh, photography is a quotation from appearances and painting is translation, which I thought was an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. 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 Who? Adorno? Okay. I don't know. No, no, no. It's a wonderful talks about translation. Poetry and drawing are exactly the, that process of translation. Wrong philosopher, just yeah. not philosopher, but yeah. yeah. it's yeah. it's world venture. Yeah, okay. Uh, That's interesting. The, the yeah. same, the same. I love that notion of translation. This, isn't that what we're doing all the time? To some extent, all the time. And uh, using and words as a form of translation from reality, yeah. And a very abstract form, I think, you know. Somebody recently called language the first technology, which is an interesting way of looking at it, you know? Um, but, you know, I suppose it is, it is a kind of transformation, it's from, mm. you know, from your experience or lived experience into the poetry. And then, then I hope that somebody else will identify with it and it will mean something to somebody beyond yourself. Yes. Uh, and of course it means, it always means something different to that, That's the point, which is great. When you start, sorry. Right. No, but just a question. I mean, when when you start writing, or it's simply because you, you have a let's call it a stutter or something in your ordinary in your ordinary mode of expression. It's not effective enough. But that's how it was for me, and when I began to write, but I suddenly found that whatever I was doing in poetry and in fiction, whatever was much more freeing than ordinary chat, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just gave you another language to work with. And all the, the stuff that you cannot deal with in ordinary speech, you get to do one way or the other, you know, mm -hmm. just when it's uh, being made of you. Unfortunately, you that can't be drawn out of time, yeah. uh, which is a great shame because we could, I think, continue this conversation for a good bit longer, but once more, thanks everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.